Good. My name is Joni Parsons, co-creator of Rebel 11, along with Monica Smith. Go ahead and say hello, Monica. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we created Rebel 11 to have edgy, fun, and informative events for women and retreats as well. Today is going to be one of those fun ones, and I'm so happy to introduce Renee Erickson. Before we get started, I wanted to tell you a little story about the first time I went to the Walrus and the Carpenter right, be, right after it had opened. I went with a very discerning friend and we ordered quite a few dishes, as many as we could off the menu because we wanted to taste everything. And I have to say that experience, it was one of those where you take a bite, you take another, you're like, oh my God, you put down the fork, you close your eyes and you enjoy every delectable flavor that is exploding in your mouth. And then you take another. I can't tell you how much that experience has stayed with me and all of Renee's restaurants do that to you. And so her books are um, something you definitely want in your home. So Renee Erickson is a James Beard award-winning chef. And what I love about Renee's philosophy is it's all about feeding people, but feeding people is all about made, being made up of family, friends, and the extended family of vintners, farmers, fishers, and others that make up the magic of what's on the table. Here in Seattle, for those of you who are not here, she has a restaurant group called Eat Sea Creatures, and she has several restaurants, including the Walrus, Deep Dive, Westward, Barnacle, a donut shop called General Purpose, and many others. She's been compared to Julia Child, and in a short while, you'll see why. I am, was so excited to get her new book called Get Away with the subtitle Food and Drink to set, um, Transport You. And I have to say that a time where we've really missed travel for obvious reasons, this book takes you on a food and drink journey across the globe. And with that, Renee, I'm so happy to have you here this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. It's lovely. Lovely to have so many people log on so quickly. I love that. Um, well, thank you for hosting us. We, um, we've been doing a fair amount of these, so it's weird to say that they feel kind of normal, but um, it's been, you know, for better or for worse, it's been a great way to still have connection with the people and, and, and share what we do. We were actually pretty fortunate. This is our office, actually, kitchen, and so I think we maybe got it built like six months before the pandemic or rough, like within a year and not knowing really that it wasn't just going to be for our staff to be cooking lunch for themselves, but for actual business purposes, <laughs> it's been pretty handy. Um, so yeah, so the book, um, do you want me to just kind of launch into how the- I'd love the to ask you a few questions about yourself first. And I would love for you to talk about that first moment that you want, knew you wanted to be a chef. <laughs> Um, Alexa, who helps me with all of these events, um, asked me that earlier and I kind of giggled. I was just like, I'm still maybe not sure I've known <laughs> that yet. Um, I started cooking uh, really young and ended up buying a restaurant when I was 25. I would very much say that I was not a chef at that point. Um, and I, I still sort of have a hard time. We kind of joke that the yes chef kind of world isn't, has never been our world. And so it's a term that I think culturally people like to apply to us, but um, I often just refer to myself as a cook. So, because um, it feels probably more correct and more natural to the way I kind of live in the world and what I care about. But um, I was really young. I bought Boat Street Cafe. Uh, I was working there and um, I was actually an art student. I had graduated from the University of Washington and was planning on um, going back to school because I thought I wanted to be an art teacher. And um, was at the time still working at Boat Street before I took it over and had been traveling. Um, I went to Rome. I did a lot of really adventurous, fun things. And over the time uh, while working at Boat Street, I eventually kind of fell in love with restaurants more than anything. And um, the opportunity to buy it, um, was given to me and um, 
I, uh, I joke that everyone that knew me at the time and that was close to me, uh, where I asked them, you know, for advice and I was trying to choose between waiting to hear whether I was getting into graduate school or buying this restaurant. And everyone told me to buy the restaurant, which I joke is that like, it was a polite way of them to tell me that I wasn't a very good artist. So <laughs> yeah, um, you know, in many senses it's true, sometimes not, but um, different kind of art now. But um, yeah, so I, you know, at that point that was 20, Two, one years ago, I think. Is that right? 21 years ago? Uh, long time ago. Maybe longer. Um, and uh, the world was very different. So we didn't have Yelp, thank God. And we didn't have Instagram or any of the things that I think um, kind of dilute in many ways what we do to a, to a moment. And it was, um, I, I'm grateful that I was able to use that time to learn and, and kind of really focused on food in a way that didn't was more about like creating food that I thought I wanted people to eat versus like worrying about you know what someone was going to say or you know like if someone was gonna you know post something nasty about something we did so it was a safe place to open a restaurant which you know now is doesn't exist so um that and you had really a quite cool. you had a lot of help from your family during that time at age 25 opening a restaurant so going back to the whole concept around friends and family making up what you do tell us about that journey yeah um, my family's been I mean I've been very lucky they've always been very involved um, in my life um, supportive of even me being an artist so that was pretty and then buying a restaurant so like both, mm -hmm. I think most normal same parents would just be like what the hell's wrong with you but um yeah, so when we first took over uh, the restaurant, I had been away and had come back and took over, um, kind of like basically met with the team that was there and, and essentially told some of them that their job was no longer going to be available to them because I was going to be cooking and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so it didn't go very well. <laughs> Most people, um, they stormed out and I kind of made a big mess um, afterwards because I was too naive to realize that they had keys still and everything. So. Um, <laughs> The first um, night that we took over, um, like, I don't think you can write this stuff as well as, um, like, literally, we took over on a Friday, I think it was, and I didn't really have any staff left because they all quit. So a girlfriend of mine from high school um, was, and my mother were the servers, um, and my dad was in the kitchen, and it was, um, it didn't go well, I'll say that much. <laughs> Um, to the point where we literally uh, had uh, Catherine Robinson in there that evening, who was a critic um, here in Seattle, and uh, she then called me on Tuesday, I believe, the following week, and was like, did something happen? <laughs> it was like, <laughs> so I was like, I to write an article, which she graciously uh, waited, and then uh, and then later wrote a really lovely article about, about Bow Street, but um, it's, you know, I think restaurants uh, are really tough businesses and I think having the support of your friends and family really um you know makes it really enjoyable it also makes it sane in many ways because you know you can ask a lot of people that love you so um, that's great yeah over the years my parents um ran Boat Street Pickles for us um they you know paved patios you know the brick patio at Walrus my dad laid before we opened um so literally, you know, everyone has pitched in in some way. So um, Renee, how do you go from one restaurant to owning a restaurant group called Eat Sea Creatures? <laughs> um, <laughs> we, well, it took a lot of time. So my first restaurant I had for um, 11 years before we opened Walrus. So it was a slow burn for a while. I was very afraid of another restaurant. Um, and I ended up with two business partners that I still am in um, business with. and. Um, that allowed me to kind of uh, think about having other people do some of the jobs that I was doing all the time. So you, it's really, um, when you have one restaurant, you, you're kind of like the person that deals with everything. So if something breaks, mm -hmm. if something, you know, if you're out of something, if, you know, whatever it is, you're the one that has to deal with it. And when, when we opened Walrus, it allowed um, other people to come in and be part of that, you know, kind of infrastructure of support and, um, myself and my business partner, Jeremy Price, and I um, are both really creative people. And um, 
some, some of the better parts of our jobs uh, is designing restaurants. So we do all the interiors of all the restaurants. Jeremy does all the um, design work for all of our branding and everything. And so it, that part of the business is really, really fun. Um, I think we might've gotten a little carried away and have too many restaurants now, but um, <laughs> it, it, it's okay. We, you know, it, it, it took a while though for us to kind of get to a place where we felt like we could do more. And I think, um, uh, Jeremy has a great uh, like description of it basically being like our company is an inchworm and most of the time we're like really stretched out and you know we're not always so good at letting our tail catch up to us so we're trying to be more mindful of that. What a great analogy <laughs> thank you for sharing that. <laughs> so I I just envision you as a 25 year old starting out and being really naive to today being, you know, really likened to Julia Child and called that by Bon Appetit. Was Julia Child an inspiration to you? Or if not Julia Child, who was? Um, absolutely. I mean, she still is, I think. Um, the, I mean, she changed food in America, you know, more than I think anyone did um, in a time where it, it was extremely, um, rare for a woman to have that kind of impact. I think, you know, it was probably more of an impact in, you know, if we look back than, than it was probably of the time, but, um, you know, she was fierce and she didn't give a shit about dropping a chicken on the floor or, you know, making a mistake. And I think it's one of my favorite um, things to remind myself, obviously, but anyone that's cooking is to not make excuses for it, you know, cause there's, there's, good versions of everything. And I think we kind of get hung up on things being perfect or, um, you know, yeah, things being perfect. And so she really um, pushed for people to not ever, you know, like if you were serving dinner to a group of people to not like speak poorly about what you've done, even if it was like a burnt, you know, burnt toast or whatever, mm -hmm. she would make light of it or, you know, just enjoy it. So, um, yeah, I think that's something that should be inspirational to everyone in, in food and that we, you know, should kind of react more to it and enjoy it versus judge it all the time. Well, and one of the things that you've said in your cookbook, I've spent a lot of time with your cookbooks over the last couple of weeks, reading uh, from start to finish. And one of the things that you mentioned is that a lot of your recipes are you know, larger so that, you know, people will have leftovers and that, you know, there's just, there's a variety of ways that you can put things together. And was that an inspiration from a chef or um, was that something that you created yourself? Um, philosophy? I mean, I think you would ask most cooks um, to make something for four and they won't be able to do it um, because we just don't think in that way. You know, like we're not it, you know, like I always make like a disgusting amount of soup and I'm like, what am I gonna do? You know, you just start, so you give it away because you're like, I don't need all this and I don't want to eat it after the second bowl. You're like, oh, this is boring. So um, I think some of it was just like happenstance from, from what I do. And then I think, uh, cert, you know, sitting around a table with more than, you know, yourself is really enjoyable. So it's nice to be able to produce enough food that you can share it with people, um, especially if it's like a gift, you know, you're giving someone, um, yeah. you know, dinner or whatever. It's, you don't want to, it's, I don't know. It's like miserly to only make a little tiny bit and give it away. So it's fun. Good. So we're going to, we're going to shift a little a bit um, away from that conversation, but you know, with the pandemic, we just need to talk about how that's impacted your restaurants in the industry as a whole. <laughs> it would be, I would be remiss in not asking you just to talk about that a little bit and in get, you know, in getaway, you actually address that, that we, you know, hope soon to get back to normal, but tell us how it's impacted you and your, in your tribe. Um, I, I mean, it has impacted us in any, every way you can imagine, you know, I think we obviously are, um, an industry that has been like very visible in the, in the fallout of the pandemic, um, in many ways, like in now it's labor shortage and, um, you know, trying to navigate regulations around vaccines and no vaccines and all that business. But, um, I think the, um, you know, long term, I think when I think about like our, you know, the people that we work with and, and the kind of um, 
abilities that they have. I think the hardest part is to just see everyone so tired. Like we're all, I think, at a point where um, we've lived through something that I think probably was the most um, short of like working in a hospital or in a clinic or something like that. Like it's been a really scary, um, exhausting place to be um, an employee. Um, and um, I think there's a, unfortunately like a good amount of lack of empathy for that. I think from, from a diner's perspective when they show up, especially now, because then people are just like thrilled to go out, which is great. So but thrilled. You know, we're still, I think, you know, it's still a pandemic. And so there's, there's a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety. And, and I think a lot of people that just are, you know, like more than anything, just really, really tired. And so um, that I think is what makes me the most sad because I think generally speaking, like we're a group of people that can like take on a mountain, you know, like we're really tough and capable. And, you know, this is, I think the one thing that has pushed us to a place where, um, you know, I know for myself, like, I'm just like, I, I, I literally look at food and I'm like, I don't even know what to do with this. Like, I'm just tired. So. <laughs> You're just tired. Well, let's talk about something positive, which is your new cookbook and, you know, really travel log as well. And you said that it was a complete fluke, that the timing just seemed to be perfect on this one. Tell us about when you initially started the idea for Getaway. Sure. So writing a cookbook, um, like I like read people telling me that they like wrote the book during the pandemic and produced it. And I'm just like, I have no idea. I mean, they maybe were held up in their house the whole time, but um, this book started in um, 20, well, late 2018. So when you get a book or when you start writing a book, you ideally get a book contract and that takes, you know, you have to put together a proposal and um, shop it around and then you get like oh you know you try you hope have a lot of people of interest and then you know you end up choosing where you want to publish the book and um, and then you start the, pro the process which um, takes forever <laughs> essentially <laughs> um, you write you know you write your outlines and you get kind of everyone that's working on the book together and start trying to like plan like what the next you know basically year and a half looks like um, we um, spent all of 2019, um, January in the spring. Well, yeah, so like we went on three big trips essentially um, to shoot all the photos that were shot in the locations um, that are featured in each chapter. And so thankfully we did all of that, um, you know, not knowing that this was happening or the pandemic was on its way. And, um, and so like, you know, I'm super happy that that was, you know, that it happened because I think the book would have, um, it wouldn't have been as lovely. I mean, I don't think it would have happened if we hadn't already done all that because it was just um, such an important part of making the book um, real um, versus- so, you know, like so, so my dog is talking, if you hear him in the back, that's Juno, just say hi. Um, but you um, take us from Normandy to Baja, Rome, London, Paris, and back to Seattle. And each, um, each chapter, here's the Rome chapter I just want to show you um, here, is just these beautiful images. Each, each chapter has a drink portion um, with simple drinks that you can make at home for two generally. And then tell us about the stories that are written about each area, Renee. Um, excuse me. Um, so... You know, the stories end up being like broader ideas around the foods that you'll find in the location. So, um, you know, in Italy, we talk a lot about um, antipasti or per, um, like the aperitivi kind of idea and, and why that, you know, why that's something that I really love. Um, they all are just things basically that I've grown to love in the locations that they're at. So in Normandy, obviously, there's a whole section on the, um, the raw milk cheese from Camembert and getting to go there and seeing this insanely beautiful place. And, and you know, also trying to like make sure that people are hoping to make, make people aware of the, the fragility of it. And that, um, you know, that's, it is literally the last um, raw milk all from Norman mm -hmm. cows that are left in Normandy, um, which is heartbreaking, you know, because yeah. we just, we take advantage or take for granted um, these 
artisan, you know, creations that um, are so easily, you know, slipping away, which I think, you know, makes a bigger conversation around like us prioritizing food and, and, you know, I think I, I've for a long time sort of felt like, you know, we as Americans are maybe the worst at that. And, you know, it's clearly not the case when you go to France and there's this, you know, beautiful cheese that's been made for, you know, since the first world war and, um, and it's, you know, slipping away there too. And, and for the same, you know, cost essentially and, and, and effort, you know, the two things that I think um, are required for food, you know, we have to pay more for really great ingredients and it takes a lot of work to get them. And so, um, yeah, so there, you know, there's kind of a thread of that throughout um, in each chapter where I'm trying to just hope that people prioritize it more in their mm -hmm. life and, and, and really like see that it's a really beautiful thing to prioritize that it makes our lives, you know, obviously it makes us healthier humans, but it makes, you know, I think the planet better and, and it's delicious. So why wouldn't you? <laughs> Absolutely. And then tell us about the drawings here. I want to show these fabulous drawings that you've added as well. Will you tell us a little bit about that? So the artist is Jeffrey Mitchell, who's one of my closest friends. Um, he was actually my uh, professor when I was at University of Washington. So many, many years ago. Um, he also did all the illustrations and the cover for my first book. So He's a really important um, friend to me and an inspiration in regards to just creativity and and his he's like prolific in what he does. Um, but there, you know, I think um, I want I wanted this book to um, I, I like the idea of capturing places in different ways, not just through photos. And and that was clearly um, the intention with Jeffrey's drawings. And they're the you know they're they're intended to be like a little funny and. Um, you know, they are. They're so. They're so charming. <laughs> they're so yeah. terrific. Yeah, it's a nice. Yeah, it's a really is, nice mix with the incredible photography. Yeah, yeah. Jim's Jim's photos are beautiful. But I like. You know, I think we can often kind of like make things seem too serious too. And so the um, you know trying to like tell stories through the drawings. Like there's a, there's a drawing that's essentially like my backyard. Um, and, and, and in having the conversation with Jeffrey about it, it's, um, you know, I basically kind of wrote like a little blurb about, you know, what my backyard is like for him to see, because those were being drawn in the pandemic. So, um, you know, we were not together when we were, when he was doing that. Um, but yeah, it's just, I think it's just a way to like feature food and, and a place in a different fashion that is, um, you know, special. So. Well, let's get started on making zucchini fritters while everyone's here tonight. So I sent everyone out the recipe so they can follow along. And this is from the Seattle chapter on page 311. If you have the book, I know Cynthia is probably looking at the book itself, but go ahead and take it away, Renee. Thank you. Sure. So yeah, um, I thought the timing was appropriate for us to do zucchini fritters because it's that time of year where we have uh, mountains of zucchinis, I think, in the farmer's markets. And then also, if you are lucky enough to have a garden and a plant that grows like crazy, you'll end up with a lot of zucchinis. Um, my zucchini plant was wretched this year. So these are not from my yard, but um, these are, I actually chose big ones on purpose. These aren't like the monster ones that often <laughs> look away for a minute and then they grow like a foot. Um, but I think, you know, like, it's important to not just assume that you can't use it. I think people, um, you know, like freeze it or make, you know, bread with it or whatever, which is all fine as well. But um, I, you know, like, I think we kind of get in the habit of like needing perfect things. And um, this is clearly a way to use up something that we maybe is like wondering what we're gonna do with this giant thing. So, um, so the recipe, basically you want to start an hour before you want to cook it. Um, you basically are going to peel, it's one potato. This is a russet potato. And then about three pounds or, you know, four-ish normal zucchini or two giant ones. Um, and you're going to grate it just on a box grater. You can use a Cuisinart if you want as well. I generally just box grate it. So this has been already grated. Um, and you put them both together in here and you're going to just put a little bit of salt over it. So it's like two teaspoons of salt. You stir it around and then you just let it hang out in a colander um, for about an hour. Um, and you, um, you'll end up with a lot of this liquid, which um, you just throw away. So 
I'm gonna do that. Um, so you also want to, which, oh, hold on. Did you squeeze the, did you squeeze the um, zucchini, did you say? No, and I haven't done that yet, which is why I need my bowl back, so. Okay. Um, and you, there is a little bit of, like, if you don't salt it all perfectly, that it can just color a little bit. Don't worry about that, because you're gonna um, cook it. So you wanna squeeze it, if you can kind of see there's a lot of water coming out of it. And I, you know, if you were, Good. You could do it over your sink. I'm just doing it right over the top of the zucchini that I'm going to just keep squeezing. Um, so yeah, squeeze it out. Um, there's a good amount of salt still left in it. So um, I generally don't salt it again until the end because I don't want it to be too salty. Um, so yeah, Is there really a favorite type of salt that you use? Um, I use a lot of salt. I'll use kosher salt. That's what I used in here because it mm -hmm. is really easy to, um, you know, evenly distribute. Um, I love, um, you know, like Florida cell or Malden salt for finishing. I think it's, it's, you know, it's very, um, clean tasting salt. I will never use iodized salt. Um, I think it tastes like metally and weird and I don't like salt that that is that fine. Like I think kosher salt has a, a better texture than really fine salt. Um, I love to put salt in um, uh, like a mortar and pestle and grind it that way too. So I'll get like gray salt. Like we sell, um, where is it from? I think it's from Slovenia of all places, but it's this really beautiful um, sea salt from, um, I think it's Slovenia, is that right? Is that on the sea? I'm like losing it a little bit. Maybe we can get that name later and we can email it out to everyone. <laughs> but yeah, so it's like a it's like a similar to like French gray sea salt, but it's not French. Um okay, so that's done. Um so the recipe is essentially um some flour, two eggs, um, and then a ton of herbs and black pepper. Um, you can kind of use whatever you want. There is um, some garnishing to be done later. So you want to reserve some of your herbs. So I went ahead and did that, so it's a cute little pot. Um, and the other thing, uh, for those of you that live in Seattle, you can raid your neighbors um, crazy fennel plant that's growing everywhere right now, which I did this afternoon and use that for fennel seed. So I see those every year and I think there's absolutely no reason why we should ever buy fennel seed. <laughs> That's such a good idea. I'm gonna walk around the neighborhood and do that. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's so beautiful. Like it's super intense, which I love. Um, and you know, cookbooks I think are great to like give you a guide to cooking. I don't think you have to like, unless you're a baker, um, I don't think you have to like strongly like adhere to it. So um, I'm not going to pay attention to the amount of things that I should be putting in here. I'm just going to put in what I want, um, which is a lot of herbs because it's um, that time of year where I think everything is still kind of growing like crazy. Um, so parsley, mint, I have a little bit of basil that's actually not in the recipe, but it's really nice. So I'm going to put that in. Um, and then marjoram, and then my little fennel seeds. So I toasted these up and they're sort of ground, um, but we're gonna use them like that. So in they go. Um, and in the book, you have a whole section on, on how to toast um, seeds and stuff, which I thought was really interesting to do it the right way. For um, like coriander and fennel are the two that I probably toast the most. And it really, um, when you toast it, it's really, I mean, you'll, you'll notice how much more aromatic and um, like intense the flavor becomes, which you don't have to always do it, but you might as well if you have the time. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so um, you're gonna basically chop all these herbs up and give it a mix and then we'll eventually we'll fry them. So I'm gonna just give this a little chop here. And, you know, like this is a great way of, you know, using everything. I try to take the stems out, but, you know, 
if you don't get them all, it's fine too. There, yes, you um, to, you, Renee, okay. somebody asked, what herbs do you use the stems from and which ones do you make sure to remove all the stems? That was what I was just gonna say, I love it. Oh, okay. So in Good. Doctor, Good. you can eat the stem of. So like I wouldn't leave thyme stems in here or like um, winter savory is another one. Summer savory, you can, it's gonna be a little bit bitter, but that's okay. I mean, I think it also just look at them, you know, like some parsley you get at the grocery store, the, the stems are pretty, um, not very nice, you know, but like these are um, pretty thin, like up on top. And I think they're fine. I think if you're, um, you know, I think you can kind of tell, but like, if you're going to eat it without removing it. So like time, like I'll throw the whole time stick in something and then be able to pull it back out kind of like you do gotcha. with stock. Um, but if you're going to eat it, um, make sure it's, you know, tender. Um, yeah, the one, like my favorite stem to eat of them all is cilantro. And I feel like for whatever reason, we've kind of weirdly been taught to throw that away. Um, but it's a really fun way. And I don't have any, of course, but it's a really fun way to, um, garnish it. Like you can kind of think of it as like chives. Um, so, um, great so idea. I'm going to bundle this all up into a little herb ball and then just go through and cut it. And while you're cutting there, um, Cynthia has a question about, I have some seeding fennel in the garden, but have never used the fresh seeds fresh. Would you, would they need toasting or can I use them fresh as is? I think you could use them. Hi, Cynthia. <laughs> so fun. Um, you can use them fresh, yeah. I mean, they're going to taste like, um, I mean, we, it's funny, we walk by this fennel bush every day when we walk our dog, and um, we always pick a few and eat them in the morning. And they they kind of, I don't know if you've ever had those um, really delicious candied fennel seeds, that you, like they're Moroccan. They're like insane. Those are so, so good. That. If the fennel's fresh, it's going to be really, really strong and delicious. And you, even in these two that you, I picked, like one's really like kind of silvery. I don't know that you can see the difference, but, and then this one looks like somebody like burnt it a little bit. It's like, yeah, kind of, definitely. Yeah. Yay. Um, so um, yeah, that's bad. You can see them side by side. I don't know if that's. Yeah, you can, de yeah, you can definitely see the difference. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm there, I can, like, where do I look? Um, so yeah, so it's, um, I think it's just a matter of um, giving it a try too and see like if it, I mean, that's one thing that's always kind of interesting. Like, um, like I remember I recently had a fresh um, Szechuan peppercorn and I was like, unfortunately like bit it, which was not a good idea because um, it's so much stronger than a regular, like one that gets cooked for a long time. So. Um, one garlic clove, um, there's two garlic cloves that are going to be used in the recipe. One goes in here and the other one goes in the little yogurt sauce that we're going to put on top. So I like to microplane it because it really gets good and fine. Um, uh, half a cup of flour. I'm going to just sprinkle this around. Do you have a favorite flour that you use? Um, we use um, Karen Springs, which is local. Um, local from Skagit Valley. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I would say that. I think it's now available at PCC. Um, mm -hmm. For a while, it was available at every restaurant and bakery and store in the city during the pandemic. So um, if you had bought like 50 pounds of it. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, I would say that is what we use the most of. And then we get stuff that's from great. small, which is another, um, oops, another um, flower from Eastern Washington. But using local is, I think, great. Why not, right? Right, local is the best. Um, okay, so some egg, flour. I feel like I overmeasured that flour. All right, so if you want, you can use um, like a spatula or you can even use your hands if you're not used out by that, but I'm just gonna give this a stir. Um, and you can add like, I have chili flake here that I thought I could put into it. Um, black pepper, can't make it over a pepper grinder. 
we, <laughs> our, our kitchen office or office kitchen, I should say, is sort of like a mishmash of stuff from my house, stuff from other restaurants, stuff <laughs> gets moved. So this dumb camping cup. Camp, camping thing. pepper today. <laughs> the last time we did one of these, I taped it with blue tape. I'm like, well, at least it doesn't say like whatever shillings or whatever. <laughs> at, least, at least you know it's yours. So we're it's like, like a like a not crappy version, but I still hate it. Like I was like told Alexa today, I'm like, we have to buy a pepper grinder. This is ridiculous. So, so Renee, a question while you're doing that. Do you think that working on cookbooks has made you a better chef? Um <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you. I mean, I think more than anything, it's just like tons of learning. Mm -hmm. Um, which, you know, I think my job for sure has changed a ton over the years, um, from like cooking on the line all the time to you know, a lot of management work. Um, so it's a nice way to be able to get back to cooking, I would say, um, more consistently. Um, I'm picking uh, marjoram leaves right now. So I'm gonna save that. And then chai was the last thing. Yeah, I would say yes. That's, you know, how can it not? Like, I think just focusing on something and learning about things is pretty, you know, it's the best best way to, I think, be better at anything. So um, it's fun too. I mean, it's, Cynthia will tell you, it's an insane amount of work, but um, it's worth it. So. Yeah, we were we had lunch over the weekend and uh, we were talking about recipe making and development and how um, specific it is and nuanced and um, she's an she's an expert. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, she's probably way better than I am. I um, I have a I you know thankfully Sarah Dickerman who wrote the book with me um, was um, really good at following me around and you know, being like, was that really a quarter cup or, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. Um, so writing a book kind of goes against any, like even just teaching this, like my, my normal way of doing this would be not paying attention to what it says in there. Um, because I feel like then I'm going to screw it up. Whereas this way I can just be like, what, well, you know, like one thing I noticed, I was like, there's lemon juice in the um, yogurt. But there's like, no, I didn't put lemon peel in this, which is stupid. So I was like, well, next time I write it, so I'm going to put lemon peel in it this time. There you go. Add, the, add that to your book. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone um, just write that in the corner. <laughs> yeah, right. add, a, add, a, add a little uh, addendum to the recipe. Little, little um, yeah, like I think lemon peel is something that I think we just throw away way too often. So um, even peeling it and freezing it, I think is a really... Uh, even if you don't have it for it yet. There. New recipe. Um, so this is a combination of oil, of like canola oil or any kind of like really neutral oil and olive oil. Um, and you want to like, uh, it's about a half a cup of oil. So it's going to have a good amount of oil in there and you're going to scoop it up like kind of in little, you know, blobs and then like pat it down a little bit. And the point of it is, I think one of the challenges of everyone that like roasts something in a pan is they want to look at it or they want to like move it, which is the first thing you don't want to do. So we're going to put probably four in here and just let them cook it for about a minute and a half or so and resist the urge to poke at it. Um, That's and then, so hard. Why is that so hard to do? Because <laughs> we don't cut ourselves, I think. Even, you know, I do that still too. Where I'm just like, well, is it done? You know, but. Um, especially with meat, like it's really scallops, you know, the one thing that like cooks in no time, but you grow it immediately is just, um, so yeah, um, the other thing, like we, I was, you know, just kind of thinking about this as a thing to be eating right now. I, my mom just gave me this giant mountain of tomatoes. So I think this with like, like a simple tomato salad would be just so delicious with lots of olive oil and more of those herbs. So, you know, I think, um, you know, thinking about food and kind of talking about it today, I was kind of laughing or I was just like staring in my fridge being like, I don't know what to make. Um, <laughs> and it's, you know, I think 
sometimes it for me right now it just feels like I'm just like overwhelmed and so I just mm -hmm. make a salad or you know or like I did yeah, I had two pieces of toast which is one, well, one thing one thing I really appreciate though about your cookbooks Renee is that you talk about the simplicity in cooking that it doesn't have to be complicated to have a really delicious meal with stuff that's right around you like I can go out tonight I mean like what you were just talking about and go pick some tomatoes or grab them from the store and I have some zucchini behind me that's a full meal and it doesn't have to be like this complicated um event every night at the table <laughs> you're on oh, the go that can be as simple yeah it's 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 tiring you know and it's a lot of planning yeah. and I think um you know it's I, I love to do that obviously I love to create like a big meal with lots of you know elements and everything but you know it's not something I can do at seven or eight o'clock at night when I'm home I'm just like what you know what's easy so um make a lot of frittatas <laughs> perfect <laughs> and there's some good dishes in both in in both right. of your books for frittatas yum I like everything from the csa frittata um all right so i'm going to add the oil and i am using like better than i should olive oil for this so i'm not going to tell you what it is um but you have some thoughts in the cookbooks about olive oil and when to use a really good one versus when to like say cook like this. Can you share that with us? So breaking the law right now. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the finer the oil, you probably shouldn't be frying with it. Although in Italy, they use extra virgin olive oil to fry with. It's not like the best, best, like first, first press, but they're going to use really delicious oil. So I think for a long time, I, you know, I think I grew up learning that, that you know, canola, peanut, safola, those were the oils that you fried in. And then I went to Italy and they're all just like, no, we fry in olive oil. So, I mean, some places don't, but like, you know, like if someone's at home, they're not gonna have like a giant stash of canola oil, they're gonna use their olive oil yeah. that they probably, you know, get from the local um, mill. So, um, so you want this to get, you know, hot obviously to fry it, but you don't want it to be smoking in a perfect world. So we'll see how we do. Um, I'm gonna grab a sponge. There's so many amazing tips in the in both cookbooks, um, the new one and the original one, which I have back here that I'll bring out. But if you just go through and read, for, you know, from cover to cover, you will be a better person <laughs> in the kitchen after you read Renee's books. So I really highly recommend that. It's been so fun for me to uh, really just peruse um, the cook the the cookbooks and find all these tips that I'm going to use um, moving forward <laughs> yeah it's you know I learn a lot every time so it's it's you know it's the best thing about food is getting exposed to new stuff so this is all set I'm, I just took a little bit of this and kind of hung it in there and it starts to bubble perfectly so we're going to go ahead and dump these in And they're not, you know, perfectly round or anything. They're just little, little zucchini bits here. Um, this is a little um, induction burner that we use. Um, but I'm going to turn up. Oh, I can't. Well, it's frying on like the middle part. <laughs> so we'll see how it turns out. But on a normal stove at home, it would, um, you know, I think, uh, Cook more evenly. So, you break it, Bobby. Uh, I brought my favorite pan um, to cook in, which is from the um, Blue Skillet people in Ballard. So, if you're not on their mailing list, you should, and then spoil yourself with a, a pan. And what there. was the name of that, Renee? Blue Skillet, right? Blue. Blue, blue, no, blue skillet, I believe. I always do this and I always forget, but they're right up down the street from the new PCC in Ballard. It's a husband and wife. They're amazing. And their um, pans are um, really, really fabulous to cook in. Like I scramble eggs in them and I don't, they don't stick because the, the metal's so fine. Blue skillet. 
Blue skillet ironware. Yeah. Blue skillet ironware. Okay, great. We have that up. Um, so, thank you, Heidi, for putting that up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so they're just going to, this is going to take a little bit longer. I think, you know, depending on your stove, it's a um, minute and a half, two minutes. I'm going to probably let this go a little bit longer than that. Meanwhile, we can make um, the little yogurt sauce, which is um, just super simple. It's that lemon juice, um, some more shaved garlic. Um, and this is um, Bellwether Farm. Oh, sorry. Um, ah, gross. Um, it's sheep's milk yogurt, which I love. Um, and I love, one of the things that I love the most about it is um, the texture of it. Like I, there's, I think I would rather never eat yogurt again if I eat that yogurt that has those weird little bits in it. Like I don't understand <laughs> why it's there. <laughs> it's so gross. So um, there's, um, this is really delicious and you can see it's like silky. I remember going to Europe the first time and eating yogurt and not really understanding why it was so much better than ours. Um, so I try to find yogurt that's like this. Um, Strauss is another favorite out of California. Um, and then, Strauss has uh, got a really good product. Yeah, they're incredible. I love it. So yogurt, um, locally, um, I'm forgetting the name again, uh, up in Skagit, you can now get it at PCC and it comes in a glass jar. Um, that's really good too. I have a really good um, Greek yogurt. So those, is it sandwich? I think so, but it's delicious as well. It wasn't, I went to, so I live on Finney Ridge and um, the Ken's market up there, I've been trying to like shop more frequently. And um, I'm so, I, I love it because they're like slowly really expanding like the, you know, like they have like a really great wine section now. Um, they had this yogurt, which made me super happy. Um, so I think it's, um, makes me happy because I can walk there. So it's nice when you can get it. It's so much. nice. Yeah. I know I've been buying this um, Twin Brook creamy, Creamery for, <laughs> A couple of, um, actually a couple of recipes from your book I've used this in, it's been really nice. All right. Obviously so it's empty. <laughs> so. All right, you did well. Um, so this is just, if you're using like a Greek yogurt, like use what you have. So if you have Greek yogurt, go ahead and use that. You can just spin it down a little bit because you want it to be able to like be drizzly. Um, and then I'm gonna add a little bit of olive oil because I love it. And then that's kind of ready. So we're just going to let that hang out. If you want, you can add salt to this as, as well, but I'm going to put um, like some, um, like this beautiful sea salt on it at the end. So there's, I'm not going to salt the yogurt yet. All right. So let's see how any of these are. Oh, they're pretty good. I'm gonna let them cook a little bit longer. Um, this is, if you don't have one of these, it's a fish spatula. It's the greatest. Go buy three. Um, go buy three. Get, I think I'll go buy some. <laughs> um, the pasta candle ones will always melt. So try to buy the wood ones. And they're actually a little cheaper, I think. So Renee, somebody asked about the names of the olive oils that you're using. Sure. So the one that I would suggest to use um, is, um, it's called uh, Atlas, good Lord. Um, so it's a Moroccan oil and it's what we use in the restaurants for regular, like just our regular olive oil. Um, <clears throat> I saw it today, I was at Ken's Market in like a retail size, we sell it at Whale Winds. Um, it's at PCC now. Um, it's one of our favorite people um, and it's his company. He started importing really beautiful olive oils and spices um, from Morocco, where he's from. And uh, so we, we buy a lot of his stuff. I'll show you one. So Renee, if people want to order from um, sea creatures, can they do that? Order olive oil? Or should oil? they go direct? For the olive oil, should they go direct or could they order it from one of your restaurants? Um, we sell um, like a three liter tin of, of 
not this, but the other, this is like his fancier one um, at Whalewind. So they can go to Whale okay. and buy it. I think, do we still sell it at Wilmox? Yes. We still, we sell all oil at our restaurant downtown too called Wilmox Ghost and online. Yeah, so we are actually, we just recently launched and are updating it. So will that be through C Eat Sea Creatures or will that be through Whale Winds? Um, either. So if you go to Sea Creatures website, um, I'm going to cheat and put this on the back. So, so bear with me. Um, um, so if you go to the Sea Creatures website, uh, you will have to link through the Whale Winds like, bit because it lists all of our restaurants. Um, if you want to just skip that step, just go to the whalewinds.com um, and you'll okay. see the um, shop, which you can also sign up for our wine club, which is my favorite. So <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna do that. But... One thing I forgot was the olive oil or the um, garlic for this sauce. So I'm gonna add a little bit more. All right. And then one more time on the goat, the name of the goat milk yogurt that you were used. It's called Bellwether Farm. And this one's sheep, not goat. Did I say goat? I'm sorry. Sheep. Well, you said sheep. That one's goat, though, did you say? Sheep. Oh, sheep. Okay. okay. So that has garlic in it now, lemon juice, and olive oil. And that sounds better. We're going to retire this one, I think. <laughs> Did it get fired tonight? But yeah, this is going to get fired for sure. Yeah. Sometimes that happens. Okay. Not good. Don't do that. My on fire. Uh, yeah, don't do uh, that. <laughs> so I'm gonna um, just let those cook a little bit longer, and then what I've done is I have a little right that you can set up, and you can turn your oven on to like 125 degrees or just the low setting, and you can just store them on here so that they don't get all sticky, um, and keep them in the oven if you're gonna cook for a lot of people. So you can just keep making them. Okay. Did you say about a hundred, or you wouldn't go to two hundred for that? Um, I would put it on your lowest, but okay, it depends on your oven. One hundred fifty, somewhere in there. Okay, cool. I don't want them to dry out. But that's the thing. So two hundred is probably fine too. Okay. Okay. Right. No. I know there's a lot of conversation lately about induction ranges in the world because I know I was in Boston for a book event and all the new um, apartment buildings and condos that are getting permitted are not allowing gas to be piped in for cooking. And so it's really interesting because I think restaurants are turning to that a lot and um, not sure how I feel about that, but <laughs> it's a little, it may, I love, you know, I think I love what I'm used to as well. So, um. yeah, I have a gas uh, stove for the first time in a long time, and it's just such a delight to cook on. It really is. I'm going to do one more round here. Try to look like my I'm getting hungrier by the minute, I have to say. <laughs> and those, those zucchini behind me are going to get grated as soon as we get off um, oh, yeah. tonight. Yes. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to do one more round. Okay. 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 Okay.
and I'm having some while we uh, do our event tonight. So in honor of your section on Italy. I love it. Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. Well, okay. speaking of wine, while you're continuing to cook, what would be a good wine pairing for the fritters this evening? For this, um, I would, I mean, I drink a lot of rosé and white wine, I think more than anything. Um, I, for this, I mean, you know, if you can stay in like the theme of, of, of your, like, you know, this as an Italian dish, which I think it's very well is. Um, like a pecorino or something from Abruzzo, Abruzzo would be lovely. Um, just something like salty and minerally. Um, mm -hmm. Generally, I prefer wines that are not in oak. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. I think a lot of people agree with you on that one. I'm like smoking myself out here. Um, all, right. all right, we're going to let this one keep going. But we can start just plating of it. So they should be pretty sturdy, so you can just pick them up. <coughs> Sorry, uh -oh. I don't know the, so I'm gassing myself out over here. <coughs> um, so then just this yogurt, and remember you're gonna put some on the other batches that are coming out, so don't use it all. That looks so good. So fun. And then some more of the little crunchy salt, but not a ton. And then you save some of the flowers, which I think are so pretty. So just, I've been uh, saving all my oregano flowers because I'm another thing that we should never buy is oregano. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> oregano. So I'm like trying to save all the little flower buds too. You can like pickle them if you want or, um, and then That's I would good. chop these. I would just pick the mint off. Um, and it is important, I would say, to eat this kind of right away at this point because the yogurt is going to kind of soften it quite a bit. Um, and the mint will turn black pretty quickly because of the heat. So I think it's ready. Yum. Yum. Oh my gosh, I'm going to go cook that right away. Who else is going to do that? Here. Where does that one go? That is just beautiful. Like okay. Mm. <laughs> fabulous so so Renee I know you're going to keep cooking but I have a, just a couple of ending questions before we go to um uh Q&A with our uh, audience tonight but what's your comfort food or and or guilty pleasure comfort food roast chicken for sure um guilty pleasure ice cream always okay a couple know. more about it but it's a pleasure. Uh, maybe what? the one thing I'm guilty about is um, nacho cheese Doritos which I also really love. <laughs> <laughs> I love crunchy Doritos. Yeah. Um, what are three of the top vegetables that you grow in your garden? Top vegetables. Um, top three. Arugula um, and I'm saying this based on like what I have the most success with not maybe my favorite. Um, I have that like um, really peppery Italian arugula that um, self sows everywhere. <laughs> so I have lots of it and I try to rip it out and use it as much as I can. And then I just ignore it for the rest of the year because I'm sick of it. Um, well, I'll take any extras that you have of that because I've just learned about that and I want to get some. And then what would you, um, a question uh, just really quick. Um, what would you tell your 25 year old self? <laughs> Um, what would I tell my 25 year old self? Travel more. What was that? Travel more. Excellent. And then what is one daily ritual you can't live without? Um, one daily ritual. <laughs> Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> and then and walking my dog, I would say are the two things that are the, you know, it's the morning time too, which is what's so nice. So 
those would be on the top of my list. And then your last question for today is what is on the top of your bucket list? Um, top of my bucket list. Gosh, I feel like I get to go on my bucket list. Hopefully, fingers crossed in a week. I'm, I'm traveling to Sicily um, oh, from fabulous. That, for a, a thing that I was supposed to do two years ago that got canceled and the house that I paid for to have for vacation afterwards won't let me move it again. So I'm like, all right, we're good. <laughs> we're doing this. So. That sounds terrific. And you deserve that after this crazy last, oh Thanks. my gosh, 18 months. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, Cynthia, I know has one. Okay. Hey, Renee. I was curious if you could share with us one of your earliest memories in the kitchen, whether that's something you cooked or like standing alongside a family member and being aware of sort of a, a cooking tradition in your own family? Um, I mean, I think I, my mom, who I, hopefully she was able to log in and I don't know if she made it or not, but she, um, we had a garden um, at our house. I grew up in Woodenville and um, she would can everything. So I remember like we had like a split level house and under the stairs was a, a room where she stored all of her um, canned goods. So I remember, you know, A, the effort of it and like the craziness of like the scary pressure cooker that felt like it was in a bomb in our kitchen. Um, and, um, you know, like as, as an adult now, like looking back at what an amazing gift that was to have, you know, we had canned peaches and pears and green beans and I don't remember what else, but I remember the peaches and the pears being the things that in like Feb February, getting to have that for breakfast was such an amazing thing. Um, I would say that and then fishing. So I would even like, I remember uh, my dad would get up early in the morning and go salmon fishing sometimes. And when I was really young, he wouldn't take me always. And I would get really annoyed and I would um, take my, my little crappy fishing pole down and like row out to this dock and sit there and catch, basically catch dogfish all day long. Um, <laughs> you know, which you can't really, I mean, you can use them for like, but they're not really delicious. But I remember, you know, like the idea of catching food um, being really, you know, exciting and important and still is, but, um, you know, as a kid to see, you know, to be able to catch a fish, um, was always really great. I remember there's a picture of me, I was probably, I don't know, six or seven and, um, we had all gone trout fishing and I was afraid to put my fingers in their gills to hold them. Um, and of course now I don't have a problem with that, but, um, later on in life, I remember people being really grossed out that, at how much I love to gut fish. <laughs> it's just like, like I, I mean, you don't know this, like when you get a salmon, obviously it's filled with all of its innards, but there's also the spine that you have to remove the blood from. And I remember being so excited about like using my thumb to like scoop all of that out. I know, sorry, you'd probably regret asking that question, but. Um, well, this is, that's really cute because in, um, in your book, your first book, there's this darling photo of you, um, with two kids um, yeah. with the crab and the, the uh, title is cleaning crabs. So we yeah. know that you love to do that. And there's some lovely photos of your family in here out um, fishing. Does anybody else have um, a question? One person asked Catherine, um, in addition to the one tool that you said, go get three, is there another favorite kitchen tool that you have? Um. I mean, the steel pans obviously are one, but that's like a very much a big splurge. Um, I love microplanes. I think we, I actually, this is a brand new one, which thrills me because I keep them too long and then they don't work very well. And um, microplane, what else do I love? Um, this summer I've, um, I have had a copper pot kicking around in the restaurant company for a while and didn't use it very often. And then this year I made jam and it, if you can find even an old copper pot that's tinned um, or that's got the lining, um, using that for fruit was really pretty awesome. It's a slurge mm -hmm. for sure, but um, they're really fantastic. It's like a great way to cook things like that. Um, Terrific. Yeah. Well, I also bought a toaster for the first time in my life. You bought a what? 
A toaster. <laughs> a toaster. Well, for the first time in your life, like tell us that story real quick before we wrap it up. Um, um, I, you know, I think for a long time I thought it was like charming, but um, I have this Italian. I had this when I was in Italy, and it's the Italian like grate. It's like this essentially, but it's on a hinge, and you put it over your burner and toast toast. But it's never as good as a toaster because it doesn't like get hard in the same way. And you like you have to turn the hood on really high because I'll like set the fire alarm off. But um, so yeah, I bought a toaster. I'm pretty excited about that. But well, that is a first. I've um, I've always had a toaster, Renee. <laughs> so well, I I, so I like, cannot. I cannot thank you enough. This has been so much fun. Renee's first book, A Boat, A Whale, and A Walrus. And her amazing next book, which just came out in April. I got a signed copy from the book Larder over the weekend because I've ordered like three books and they haven't come. So I went and bought two more. So I bought like five books, which is just great because guess what? They're going to be amazing holiday gifts. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. This has just been delightful. I'm a huge fan and it's just such a joy to be able to have this hour with you. So thank you. My pleasure. It was fun. I see some faces that I recognize too. Hi, Rachel. Yeah, and hi, Rachel. And Monica, why don't you tell us what's coming up? Sure. 